Zoom um, audience room. And also another, another way is that you can watch us uh, through the Facebook Live of NAA channels. So without further ado, let me give a little background on um, today's sessions. You know, everybody knows that with this outbreak of COVID-19, you know, it's a, it's a phenomenon that we have lesson learned all over with the circumstances. And of course, we want to hear what are, you know, the measures and what are the uh, actions that one of the countries that are very, very, that are leading in terms of innovation system, which is Sweden. Sweden is actually today one of the world's innovation leaders. Um, Sweden is now ranked number two right now in Global Innovation Index uh, of 2019 by WIPO. And of course, in Boomsburg uh, Innovation Index in, uh, of this year, Sweden is already ranked number five. And with that, you know, Stockholm is also known to be Europe's technical startup capital and having per capita unicorns only second to Silicon Valley. And we want to, you know, learn more and be very excited. And with that, you know, Sweden is still seeing the needs of world-class innovation, you know, as, as a, a world-class innovation nations to be more innovative, to meet global challenges, you know, and, and with these dialogues, then we can hear more today. So without further ado of this sessions, we have, um, you know, been very honored to receive uh, the ambassadors uh, to, come and join us both from the Thailand side and from the Sweden side. So without further ado, let me first uh, invite His Excellency Stefan Hörstrom, the Swedish ambassador to Thailand to give the first opening remark. His Excellency, would you please? Good morning, Saudi Kra. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank uh, the National Innovation Agency and uh, also Ambassador Kanchana for this initiative and for inviting me to make a few introductory remarks. I've been Swedish ambassador to Thailand for nearly five years now. I will sadly leave Bangkok for the last time in only two weeks. Uh, interestingly enough, my term started with innovation and it ends with innovation. And that tells you something about the relevance of this subject for uh, Thai-Swedish relations and cooperation. It started with innovation, one of my first days in the embassy from the National Innovation Agency to a conference with one of the leading Swedish experts, Professor Charles Edqvist, as a lecturer, early September 2015. After that, several initiatives have followed, not least by the Thai embassy in Stockholm. And I remember also uh, presenting Swedish experiences of this kind at a so-called Nordic 4.0 seminar organized by the Thai Ministry of Foreign Affairs three years ago. Now I'm ending my term by addressing this webinar. I'm doing it strongly convinced that Thailand and Sweden should collaborate more. We have remarkable people-to-people -people relations. We, our embassy, Sweden, highlighted them when we celebrated 150 years of re relations between Thailand and Sweden two years ago. We did it with a photo exhibition uh, presenting 15 individuals illustrating these linkages. And we call this uh, uh, exhibition Neighbors from Afar because we feel we are so close to each other despite the geographical distance. As for trade, there are presently over 85 Swedish companies in Thailand and several of them focus on fostering innovation through employee development programs and scholarships. In the business climate survey conducted earlier this year, uh, one of the, among these companies, one of the top 10 challenges that the Swedish companies come across in Thailand is obtaining skilled labor, especially with knowledge in science and technology. Now, others are experts on the do's and don'ts of Sweden in the area of innovation. I leave that to them. But let me just say a few words about a couple of what, what I believe are uh, fundamental preconditions for the development of an innovative society, which in its turn is an important element in the sustainable development goal number nine. And uh, conditions that I believe have contributed to the fact that Sweden has been ranked highly, as was mentioned, uh, not 
including one week, one week ago, once again was ranked the EU innovation leader, followed by Finland and Denmark. I'll say a few words about these preconditions from my point of view, and then you can correct me if you think I'm wrong. And let me do that by uh, quoting a Swedish female uh, ICT entrepreneur and inv innovator, Stina Erensvärd. This is the quote. Any country that wants to foster innovation also needs to encourage some disobedience from its citizens. Innovation is about questioning what has been said and done and knowing that it's safe to take the risk to explore new territory. I, and this is Stina speaking, was fortunate to grow up in Sweden, a land of vast forests that hasn't been at war for almost 200 years and where the corporal punishment of children is forbidden by law. Pippi Longstocking, my comment celebrating her 75th birthday this year. Pippi Longstocking, says Tina, was my fictional hero and role model. I couldn't carry a horse like Pippi, but thanks to tree climbing, I beat most boys my age at arm wrestling. And never once did I feel I had less power or freedom than my two brothers. Though my family, couldn't afford a new Volvo, and I inherited jeans and sneakers from my older siblings, we all benefited from good publicly funded schooling. From elementary school onwards, we were encouraged to think independently and be inquisitive." End of quote, Stina Jensen. So I believe this kind of openness is key, one of the keys. Openness, first of all, to the world around us. Sweden is a free trade nation with less than 0.1414 of the global population, we depend on the outside world. Isolation has never been an option. Both exports and imports are vital to Sweden's welfare and international skills of all possible kinds are welcome. Immigrants have contributed to our diversity and broadened our perspectives over and over again during centuries. With the current global pandemic, there is an emerging risk that domestic and foreign policy in many countries in the world will turn instead inward looking and protectionist. We saw that threat even before COVID-19 and we must resist and we must join forces to resist. I think Thailand and Sweden should join forces to resist these tendencies. Openness is key. Openness to new ideas to be tested in a free debate to be researched by independent scholars, academic freedom, freedom of expression, a readiness to, to question old paradigms and old truths. An educational system, free, paid by taxes, where children and students are encouraged to think outside the box. People who are commanded from schools and onwards to think and act inside the box will certainly face difficulties transforming themselves to innovators. Sweden is also a society where opportunities are open, need to be open, both for women and men. The female participation in the labor market is very high, around 77%, and it's helped by affordable, high-quality childcare, and by men taking responsibility for family and children, not enough, but more than before. So, there is a strong belief in the individual and making space for individuals to exchange ideas, to be creative, to be innovators. The welfare state is supporting this, supporting individuals, not restricting them. There's a lot more needed for innovation to thrive, but I think all this has helped us a lot. So good luck with the webinar. I for, look forward to follow it. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you so much, His uh, Excellency Stefan, the Swedish ambassador to Thailand. Uh, you're, it's, it's a great opening. Open, opening and openness is the key, as you said. So um, let's go to our Thai ambassador to Sweden, also Her Excellency Ganjana Pacharacho, and she would give us also the welcoming remark on the Thai side, please. So Dika, so Dika, so Dika, Ambassador Stefan. So speaking here from Stockholm, it's summertime in Stockholm. Very nice here. Okay, first of all, thank you very much, Kun Teresa, and thank you, Dr. Pan An, uh, for NIA co-hosting this webinar together with the Royal Thai Embassy. Um, 
Ambassador Stefan was in Thailand, has been in Thailand for five years. I have just been in Sweden for four months, uh -huh. but the past four months have been well spent. I have been learning a lot about the Swedish innovation system, and I'm very much impressed by how Sweden works to promote innovation. Sweden spends 3.3 .3 of their GDP on research and development. That is very impressive. And Sweden is one among the countries that spend 1% of the GDP to development assistance. Maybe the only country, I'm not so sure, but it's very high for, for development assistance. And uh, development assistance nowadays is on innovation. So it's going to be on innovation for sustainability. I'm very much impressed by the Swedish system. Um, let me cite some examples. Uh, for example, uh, the EU set their goal to be carbon neutral by 2050. Sweden's goal for carbon neutral is 2045. And even cities announced their goals for carbon neutral, even lower than that. City of Shopping announced uh, its goal to be carbon neutral by 2025, for example. The forest area in Sweden, now uh, the Sweden's landscape is covered by about 70% of forests. And, and that gives me hope because just over 100 years ago, Sweden was covered by only 30% of forests. So that, that tells that in one generation, we can actually plant back our forests. So that's why I think innovation uh, system in Sweden is something that Thailand and any other country can learn. Uh, it's not about ranking, you know, it's about collaborative approach and um, most impressed is the openness, you know, the way the public sector, the private sector, the universities and communities work together to make impacts to society. I uh, think that Thai people are also very creative and resilient. We have been through the 1997 Tom Yam Gung crisis. We have been through the big flood in 2011. And of course, uh, a number of um, series of political struggles, but um, Thailand has been through all of those and we can always come back. And with the current COVID-19, uh, we shall overcome too. So I think that the webinar today will be very useful in terms of learning the ecosystem that Sweden has provided for innovation to prosper in, in Sweden. And then I think that if we learn, if Thailand learn from Sweden, then of course it's not going to benefit only Thailand, but it's going to benefit countries in the region as well, because Thailand is the regional hub for knowledge. So we can share, share whatever we learn in terms of innovation from Sweden to other countries in the region. So the Royal Thai Embassy looks forward to working closely with Vinova, with the National Innovation Council, with Business Sweden, with AUMI, and with all other agencies, both public and private alike in Sweden. So um, let's keep learning and let's keep innovating together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Her Excellency Kanchanaka, for the Thai ambassador to Sweden. As you said, let's keep learning and working together. And this is this session is part of that, right? To learn together and from both country and also for other countries in the region as well. And uh, thirdly, I would like to invite Dr. Pan A Chairat, uh, the executive director of National Innovation Agency of Thailand, to uh, Give us a, a few words about this event and this webinar, please. Thank you, Kun Teresa. Good morning, Sviria, and Sawadee Club. Uh, on behalf of uh, National Innovation Agencies, or NIA, uh, under Ministries of Higher Education, Science Research, and Innovations of Thailand, uh, it's a great honor for me uh, to be here and address this gathering today. First of all, I would like to thank you, uh, His Excellency, uh, Swedish Ambassador to Thailand, uh, for nice opening words. And I would say that uh, it's quite a coincidence that uh, my first innovation professors happened to be Professor Charles Edwards, and 
he happened to be the first uh, speakers for, for your first uh, talks in the Kingdom of Thailand. And it's quite remarkable that we have been working with him uh, since 1995. It's already 35 years for me when I first encountered with a Swedish innovation and environment when I was a student in Lin Shoping. And also uh, Her Excellency Kanchana, uh, Thai Ambassador to Sweden, our co-host, I would like to thank you for good collaborations and organizing this insightful webinar together with our colleagues in Stockholm. Uh, this forum is a great example of Thai-Sweden innovation collaborations to maintain our strong relationship and expand connection in the time of global crisis. Can I conceive a concept of innovation diplomacy a couple of years ago as a platform of international engagement on innovation, uh, startup, and investment. I think we all have no doubt that today's crisis acts as a world accelerator of innovation. Global transformational innovation becomes a central of attention, and the virus already disrupts a business as usual innovation process. Countries all around the world are trying to seek for a new type of innovation to cope with the current situation. In the case of Sweden, I would like to say that a Swedish model is always a good example of resilience and uh, a good example for innovation practitioners and scholars, including policy makers. Particularly, an achievement of a system after uh, graduate from a Swedish paradox, a paradox that uh, has been a, a situation that innovation input and output imbalance in the early and late 1980s and 90s. That's why uh, Sweden uh, becomes a very reputable country as small countries, but strong national innovation system. Also Scandinavian design phenomena, for example, IKEA, it's marked an urban living mega stores and also uh, make it as a trend setters for people all around the world who live in the cities. This includes Scandinavia models of innovation. I would like to call it as a double or triple helix, a policy that we know has been uh, uh, developed since 20 years ago. And now we are uh, following up the ways that we develop our regional innovation system, just a similar to a Swedish model and including a social welfare. Again, uh, when we're talking about transformation, I would like to say that for the past uh, centuries, we have learned uh, Sweden as a case studies of transforming uh, from uh, so-called low uh, value uh, economy like ion based Economy into a digital startup and make Stockholm as one of a European startup capital. And also, we are working on Bangkok as a hub of a startup ecosystem in Southeast Asia as well. And this includes a current Swedish herd immunity model, which we are waiting to see a result and lesson learned uh, from such endeavors. Sweden would, would be a good example for many countries to examine how its innovation system help elevate the impacts of the COVID-19 and also how innovation system need to be strengthened in the post-COVID-19 era. For Thailand, uh, we have been working along the way that we learned from Scandinavian and also Sweden. Uh, we, we went uh, to Sweden to learn about regional innovation system and also how to leverage uh, the capital market and also start up for the past two years. And also in the, in the times of COVID-19, uh, we successfully as a country to be one of the 14 countries that European Union just announced that uh, we are among the safest countries all around the world for people at this moment. And also the scheme on telehealth and also uh, on medical service that we uh, work as innovation as a process 
it's already paid off for the past month. We haven't been that many cases and new cases on COVID-19. That's remark and also make a new endeavors on what we think about innovation and we can learn from Sweden model. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that all of you will find this webinar useful and thought provoking. Today we will learn and gain more knowledge uh, from our partners from Sweden who are keen on Swedish innovation system. Uh, these objectives and solutions could be found uh, for supporting international collaborations and also to unite between Sweden and Thailand to become stronger and expand our network to a global stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Panat Chairat Kabi, Executive Director of National Innovation Agency of Thailand or NIA. Uh, so with all that uh, remarks, I think we have captured, you know, how this session is very important to learn together, to understand the Swedish uh, innovation systems and to, you know, maybe collaborate more between Thailand and Sweden and also with other countries in the region, the, both the European side and the Asia side. So um, let me now, uh, you know, today talk about and introduce our speaker today. Uh, we have quite honored to, you know, have many speakers from the Swedish innovation system together with us. So let me introduce them one by one. And uh, just so that, you know, they know who you are, you can say hello just a little bit <laughs> when, when I talk uh, about you. So let me first, first of all, introduce Mr. Carl Linwell. Uh, Carl is the country manager of, uh, of for Thailand at Business Sweden and Kao is, um, you know, of course, the Swedish trade and in West Council. Business Sweden is a semi governmental Swedish organization and aiming to support Swedish businesses on their abroad market and to support foreign entity wishing to invest in Sweden. And Kao has 10 years of experience uh, in Asia and Thailand and working for and with Swedish companies navigating the business landscape of the region. So uh, maybe we will not go into the session yet. So we, uh, let me uh, first introduce all the speaker, but maybe Kao can say hello right now. Sure, yeah, I'd like to say hello. Um, very happy to be here, of course. Thank you so much to the NIA for, for, for inviting me and to Business Sweden to this uh, seminar. And I can't wait to share some remarks in a little bit, but also hear about uh, what my partners and in the innovation ecosystem of Sweden has to say as well. Great, great. Thank you, Carl. Okay, second speaker is Eric uh, Ostad. And he's from the Prime Minister's Office of National Innovation Council. And also this is very interesting because Sweden has National Innovation Council. Eric is the head of section at the office of the Swedish National Innovation Council within the Prime Minister's Office, where he is responsible for the planning and executions of the council's meeting, as well as the implementations of the council's recommendations. And prior to this position, Eric spent uh, many years at the Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation dealing with startups and incubator policy development, innovation procurement, and international collaborations in innovation and research. So, hello, Eric. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Looking forward to share my, my experiences. Great, we love to hear from you. Okay, and the third speaker, very honored to have the Chief Strategist Officer of Vinova, uh, Mr. Shell Hogan. Nafet, and he's uh, responsible for funding of initiatives that advance the knowledge field of experimental economy, of course, focusing on how to manage funding, development, and evaluation of initiatives characterized by uncertainty, of course, outcomes and wicked problems on strategy development and how to promote and support innovation in SMEs and growth in entrepreneurial ventures. Hello. Hi, Xiao. Hi, Savadi Kapp. Good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm really interested in sharing some of my perspectives with you all. Great. So, Thank you. Thank you. All right. And last but not least, uh, let me introduce Sarah Brunt. Ms. Uh, Sarah Brunt is the Executive Vice President of AOMI. And uh, previously, she has been the Executive VP and CEO of many organizations uh, in Nordic, of Berner Nordic, and has extensive experience from B2B and also B2C in the private sectors, holding leading positions within the FMCG industry in Nordic with companies such as 
uh, Cordero, Okla, Coca-Cola, and Unilever are also an active board member of Sweden Care AB and Aumi subsidiaries. Hi, Sarah. Hello. Hi. Thank you for having me at the webinar. I'm looking forward to the session today. Great, great. Okay. So um, with that, you know, all the speakers, very excited. All of you are very knowledgeable of today's event. And, you know, we will learn a great deal. Let me just uh, tell the audience a little bit that you can leave your questions if you have along the way uh, during the chats in both the Facebook Live and also in the Zoom audience room. Uh, and we will pick that up at the end of this webinar. Okay. So first uh, session would be by Carl. Uh, business Sweden, and he would talk about business innovation, Swedish economic resilience, and of course, introduction to Swedish innovation system. So let me give the floor to Carl. Thank you so much, Teresa. And I think that we have asked your, your colleague, Patty to yes, actually be in charge of showing the, uh, the slides as well. Yes. So let's maybe wait yeah. until those get on screen. Perfect. Thank you so much, Patty. So again, my name is Carl Lindwell, and I represent Business Sweden, the Swedish Trade and Invest Council, uh, a semi-governmental organization uh, owned by 50% by the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and 50% by the Swedish Association of Exporting Companies. Uh, so maybe we can just uh, move to the next slide, please, Patty, and I'll just uh, explain a little bit about who we are. So Sweden is, uh, as I think everyone here may know, not a very big country in terms of population. We're only roughly 10 million people. People now, even though that has been growing quite steadily. When I was a kid, we said that we were 8 million people. Um, so we're a small country. Uh, we have a fairly large amount of, uh, of MNCs, of large companies, and we're, of course, very reliant on their success abroad in order to basically uh, fund the, the society and the welfare state that we have today. So back in the 1970s, uh, it was decided uh, to form a Swedish Trade Council, what is today Business Sweden, and our role is essentially to to support Swedish companies on their abroad markets to ensure that they are successful. So uh, we were at roughly 50 different locations uh, throughout the world, the orange part you can see there. Uh, and I have the, the big honor of uh, representing Business Sweden in Thailand, but also the neighboring uh, markets of Myanmar, Cambodia, and also Laos. Um, what we do, uh, often what we do is that we, we provide support uh, to a Swedish company that may want to enter the Thai market, but can't really figure out how to do it. What are the customers? What do they look like? What are the purchasing criteria and so on? Uh, but we also work, of course, more and more uh, with uh, different innovation related uh, assignments. So if you could change uh, the slide, please, Patty. Um, one example is the Nordic Innovation House, where we are involved together with Vinova, but also uh, the other Nordic countries to create innovation platforms and areas of community, networking programs and events and, and various innovation hotspots around the world. So uh, we have this initiative in Silicon Valley, New York, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong and Tokyo. I would, of course, be very happy to bring this to, to Thailand one day as well. Uh, that's a little bit about me, uh, but what I would like to talk uh, about is, yes, Innovative Sweden, co-creating the future, as it's written here on the slide. So, uh, as has been mentioned, innovation has had a crucial role in the development of Sweden's welfare and success over the years. But dare I say that innovation has never been as important as it has been today moving into the future. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, sustainable, one more next slide, please. I think that may be an old version of the presentation. Yeah, so a sustainable future requires a completely new type of innovation. We need to transform our society, uh, our cities, our welfare, our value chains, and our consumption patterns to sustainable alternatives. And if we are to succeed, we must look at innovation from a holistic perspective. We need to think about innovation at a system level. And this requires, obviously, new legislation, new rules, new structures, enabling and supporting transformation. It also requires a collaboration on a broad front between organization, industries, and also countries. Uh, next slide, please. So Sweden has for centuries had the will and the ability to successfully transform. Uh, Sweden has not always been a quote-unquote rich country. In the late 1800s, as an example, Sweden was actually among the poorest nations in the world. We have found ways to handle societal and industry shifts and to adapt to the changing world around us. We've transformed from being a poor agricultural nation to an industrial society and now to one of the world's most digitized countries. 
And as I mentioned before, as a small export dependent country, globalization has a decisive influence on the economic development of Sweden. And that's why I'm so happy to hear the remarks from uh, Excellencies Kanchana and Stefan when it comes to the importance of, of globalization and economic collaboration also into the future. And Sweden's future is determined by how well our companies succeed in leveraging new opportunities and meeting the global market's changing needs in a competitive way. Uh, this picture, uh, I think uh, Her Excellency Kanchana mentioned uh, forestry. Of course, Sweden has a whole lot of trees, but also what can be mentioned is that the, the woman here in the front of the picture, she's actually wearing a dress that is entirely made from materials extracted by wood. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. Um, I won't bore you with too many statistics, uh, but yes, Sweden has ranked very highly in many various global innovation indices. Our capacity for innovation is high. Um, according to studies and comparison by the European Commission, the World Economic Forum, and other well-reputed uh, institutions. Uh, this is a position that we're, of course, working hard to maintain by never being fully satisfied and by constantly improving. Um, next slide, please. Uh, one more next slide, please. There we go. Thank you. Uh, so during the past decade, Sweden has developed, uh, may I say, a world-class startup scene, creating a vast amount of attention from entrepreneurs, from investors, and from talents. Um, after Silicon Valley, uh, the Swedish capital Stockholm produces the highest number of so-called unicorns, or these billion-dollar tech companies per capita more than any other city. Uh, this position, again, is confirmed by the European Digital City Index, ranking Stockholm second in both terms of ecosystem for startups and scale-ups. Uh, a number of factors have created this environment that has fostered over 22,000 tech businesses, and that is in Stockholm alone. Uh, next slide, please. So why have we been able to have such relative success for such a small country when it comes to creating global uh, innovative companies? Uh, so let's have a little bit of a peek behind the scenes. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, uh, one more next slide, please. There we go. Uh, so Sweden has unlocked the potential of the entire population, and we do have the highest female and maternal employment rates in Europe. Work-life balance is deeply ingrained into our culture, making it possible to combine a family life with having a career. The welfare system has been created to offer a high quality of life and to enable men and women equal opportunities. Daycare costs are subsidized by the government, making it very affordable. The welfare system creates a safety net for individuals, making it possible to try to find an alternative career or to develop a business idea. And if you fail, it's not the end of the world. It's not like you will lose your entire life. Uh, a full-time employee in Sweden gets a minimum of five weeks of paid vacation. And if you were to, to start a family and have children, we have 480 days of paid parental leave. And until your youngest child is eight years of old, uh, it's actually possible to work at 75%. And it's often during this time uh, when people have the time to reflect that new ideas often pop up and grow. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we do strongly believe in the, in the power of creativity. Uh, throughout daycare, the school system, and work life, creativity is actively encouraged, uh, letting people free their mind and to think outside the box that has paved way for success in many ways. Uh, not only are we the world's number one exporter of music in relation to GDP, we've all heard about ABBA and Ace of Base and Roxette, but also more modern versions such as Avicii and Swedish House Mafia, to, to name a few. Uh, but we've also had uh, big global successes in literature and film, Stieg Larsson and the Millennium, Millennium Trilogy, uh, Trilogy Design. Uh, tourist attractions, and exciting digital companies revolutionizing industries. Of course, Spotify, Skype, and Minecraft are, are three of such examples. Uh, we also have an open and international climate that influences uh, uh, competencies com coming together, creating a hotbed of new ideas. Uh, and if you add to this a Swedish management style that encourages cooperation and critical thinking, uh, that's probably a part of the, the reason why Sweden has been uh, so successful. Uh, if we move to the next slide, please, and, and talk a little bit about uh, technology. Yeah. Um, so we've always been open to international trade, new influences, and also foreign uh, talent and foreign people. With this comes a curiosity for new ideas, for new trends and technologies. We are an innovation-friendly country. Uh, you can say that we often fear old technology and always welcome what is new. 
uh, we've taken several strategic decisions that has enabled our society and, and, and our people to become early adopters. One example uh, is the very, uh, very heavy and very groundbreaking investment in broadband and digital infrastructure in the early 90s, uh, giving us a world-class infrastructure today and among the highest penetration rates of both internet users and smartphones in, in the world. Um, we also um, have created a lot of innovations when it comes to, to, to systems uh, for digital technology. When it comes to modern digital payment solutions, we have famous examples such as iSettle and the Swedish company uh, Swish, allowing you to, to send money or microtransactions to friends or companies or organizations using your mobile phone. Uh, this is, of course, happening in many, many, uh, many other countries as well. But Sweden is already almost cashless, and it's certainly possible that we may be uh, the world uh, world's first truly cashless societies, just in a matter of a few uh, years. Uh, if we move on to the next uh, image, please. So, as was mentioned before, uh, we spend a, a good amount of of, uh, of annual investments in, in R and D. It's three point three percent of Sweden's GDP, uh, which is higher than the OECD average of two point three percent. The largest share of these investments, roughly sixty percent, comes from the private sector, but the public sector also plays a very active role uh, when it comes to finances uh, financing in R and D. Um, on a national level, a collaborative approach has been uh, set up to address future challenges and opportunities within smart cities, the future of mobility, transportation, life science, connected industry, new materials, and bio-based economies. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. Um, also, when it comes to academic excellence, uh, many of us have heard about uh, the Nobel Prize, which is kind of a testament to our longstanding commitment to excellence in research. Uh, but the entire Swedish education system is ranked as one of the best in the world, and several Swedish universities uh, are ranked uh, as being on uh, the top 100 global universities uh, list. And for a country with a population of only 10 million people, or, or 0. 13% of the whole world. This is quite uh, remarkable. Uh, if we move on to, to the next slide, please. So innovation is a core business uh, in Sweden's business sector. A surprisingly large number of multinational export companies have started their journey in Sweden. And this image just sh uh, shows some of them. So with a small domestic market, as I mentioned, Swedish companies with an ambition to grow, they need to export to customers around the world. And this has made Sweden an early player on the globalized market. So as mentioned, we are a country of tech and technology is successfully combined with other industries such as gaming, finance, music, food, environment, creating new types of uh, flourishing competencies in, in ICT and in IoT, gaming, fintech, music tech, clean tech, food tech, ed tech, med tech, and all the other techs. Uh, you might have heard of, of uh, companies such as uh, Skype, uh, Spotify, Klarna, Bambora, iSettle, FI Server, Mojang, uh, King. Uh, these are all companies that started off as being unicorns. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and another area we shouldn't really forget about is that Sweden has a large public sector. It is absolutely uh, no secret that we do pay a fair amount of taxes and we have a big public sector. Actually, 30% of the entire Swedish workforce is employed in this sector. Um, and we have an aging population uh, in certain ways such uh, similar to Thailand. Uh, so digitalization and ur urbanization in these uh, challenges, the public sector is facing uh, fairly big challenges. So this requires an increased efficiency and in service delivery, as well as new types of services meeting societal needs. There's therefore constant focus on innovation and development, even in the Swedish public sector, uh, with a user at its core. One good example, I think, is a Swedish tax agency, which is basically the tax agency Manage registrations of private individuals, and also re responsible for the for the collection of many kinds of taxes: personal income tax, corporate tax, VAT, excise tax, and so on. And the agency has, over the years, gone from being kind of an accounting firm more to a to a service provider. Uh, when it's time to to do our yearly taxes, it's a very easy process in Sweden. Uh, there's an app for that. Um, you, you often get an SMS uh, message with, uh, with a calculated uh, preliminary taxes. And all you have to do to do your taxes is generally just to send an SMS back, back to write OK or to go through the app if you need to do any, uh, any amendments. Uh, so I would say we have a very, very well-functioning uh, and efficient public sector uh, that supports us. Uh, so the next and the last slide, please. Um, of course, um, we believe very much in this quadruple helix system. Uh, when a strong business sector, academic excellence, and an innovative public sector is brought together, that's often when innovation excels. 
We have a long tradition of collaboration among these three sectors in Sweden, and many of our largest companies have emerged and prospered through such interaction. In the last few years, the civil society has been incorporated in the system, creating a, this quadruple helix system. So by bringing competence and ideas together, uh, we favor innovation and new technology, and this is crucial in the transformation to a sustainable society. Uh, I think that is uh, most of my time. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to, to listen to my words, and I look forward to, uh, to uh, joining the Q&A later. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Carl. That's a very, very good, um, you know, introductions of the of the Swedish innovation system. I think we learn a lot talking about the Nordic Innovation House. Look and uh, you know, holistic, uh, you know, systematic of innovations. And of course, I'm impressed. Of you said that you have about twenty two thousand texts already, you know, in Stockholm only, and that's wow. That's that's quite big. Uh, you know, amount of, of company. And of course, being a female, you have the highest female uh, rate of employment. You know, I want to live there. Can I go now? <laughs> and and work-life balance, you know, and that's, of course, that's, that's create creativity and everything else that can be innovation. Okay, great. Perfect start. Okay, second speaker, I'd like to, you know, give the floor to Eric. And Eric, we'll talk about future of innovations and government's contribution. This is very important. If we talk about policy now, you know, talking about the National Innovation Councils of Sweden, what do they do? What kind of promotions? Uh, so let me give the floor to you. Thank you so much. So what you have? Uh, can you hear me, everyone? Yeah, yes. I hope. Yeah. I hope not. Okay, great. Hey, the slides uh, you, know, you, know, you never know if your microphone is on or not. So, 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 excellencies and ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be here and thank you for organizing um, this initiative, this seminar. Um, my name is Eric Ostet. I work at the office of the National Innovation Council. So this is located uh, at the prime minister's office. And uh, you could say that I'm part of the team that organizes and uh, follows up on the National Innovation Council meetings. And, and um, as you said, Teresa, um, um, we talk about the future, but I will focus a little bit on one specific part of the government role, which is uh, the National Innovation Council. Uh, and that is um, an initiative from the prime minister. So uh, I will ask, also ask Patty to help me change the slides. So, so um, thank you. Okay, you could uh, move to the next slide, please. So the National Innovation Council, first of all, I would like to say that this is an initiative from the prime minister himself. Uh, he founded the National Innovation Council back in 2015, uh, really emphasizing that innovation is a top priority for the government. And uh, this is also expressed um, in the way that uh, the prime minister is leading each meeting uh, personally uh, with the National Innovation Council. And uh, as, as uh, previous uh, speakers, uh, the ambassador and, and, and Business Sweden um, mentioned, we have a strong tradition of collaboration in Sweden between societal sectors, uh, public, private and academia, and we're quite proud of that. And the Innovation Council builds on that tradition uh, by bringing all these different parts of society together to focus on, on, on challenges that needs to be solved. And uh, so, so the purpose is to create better conditions for innovation in Sweden, uh, strengthen Swedish competitiveness and address societal challenges. So uh, that's a quite ambitious uh, goal with, with the council. Uh, and you know, uh, uh, okay, uh, please go back. Uh, I wasn't uh, quite ready yet. Um, so, we aspire to keep our position as a global innovation leader and, and we believe that collaboration is a key factor and the challenges that we face today cannot be solved by just one policy area or one sector in society we need to work together and we need to look at innovation policy and and, and policies in general in, in a little bit different way maybe than than we've done historically uh, we also need ministries to collaborate closer. And this is quite important for, for, for the government part. So having this innovation council with multiple uh, ministers is a way of bringing different ministries together. Uh, and I guess um, you, you know that sometimes uh, ministries 
they have uh, they are wor they work a lot in silos they all have their special interests and and this can sometimes be limiting to the the speed of, of innovation and the ability to solve challenges so this is also something that we try to address increase and enhance the cross cross sector collaboration even within the government within the government offices and um, I would like to finish this slide by saying that it's important to stress that the Innovation Council is an advisory body to the government. So there, there are no formal decisions being taken during the meetings. It, it, it is a, a group that discusses uh, challenges and how to solve them. And then the ideas and suggestions that are being brought up during the meetings, they are, are processed further within the government offices. So this is also where me and my colleagues uh, um, uh, are important. So next slide, please. Um, great. And this, this slide is a little bit of an example of what I said about multiple policies and, and, and having a, um, um, a broad holistic view on innovation. Uh, when the National Innovation Council have their meetings, we don't talk about innovation just in the sense of, of business or industry policy. Of course, competitiveness is, is important, but we, we also look at innovation as a way of solving complex societal challenges. Uh, and um, like I said, we need to avoid working in silos and, and having I mean, you see in the slide a few examples of, of, of various policies and, and uh, important topics that we try to address uh, and have addressed uh, in the Council. Um, so there is not one single player or one single policy area, but, but uh, multiple policy areas and how they uh, connect to each other. And having a challenge-driven approach is very imp important because that means that we first define the challenge that must be solved. And then we look at what ministries, what government agencies, what other stakeholders in society should be involved. And um, prime example is of course, climate change, health uh, and new technologies. And we need to look at this from a cross sectoral perspective. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, this is the basic information about uh, how the council works. So we have four regular meetings per year. Usually uh, there are two meetings per semester and uh, these take place in Stockholm at the government offices. And uh, the meetings, these regular meetings, they are closed sessions. So they're not open to the public and they follow the Chatham House rules, which means that uh, every Everything that is being said is, is staying in the meeting. Of course, the members are, are able to talk about the council and talk about what has been discussed, but we're not quoting uh, what people are saying. And, and of course, the, the goal is to have a trusted and, and intimate setting to, to talk about uh, various uh, challenges. And we also arrange uh, two regional meetings per year, one in the spring, one in the fall. And these regional meetings are a little bit different. This is where we uh, visit various parts of Sweden to uh, gather regional representatives from all sectors of society. Um, and the prime minister is also, of course, leading these meetings. He, he's the chairman of, of, of all the meetings. And these regional meetings are, are a way of talking about the synergies between the regional level and the national level, and especially how national policies affect regional innovation capacity and how we can strengthen regional innovation systems. Because a lot of innovation in Sweden happens on the regional level uh, between the university and businesses and, and the public sector within the region. And uh, then I, uh, I would like to say that, of course, there's a lot of planning and follow up in the government offices. Uh, and um, we have, of course, a lot of meetings outside the, the regular uh, and regional meetings uh, more, like, more internally within the government offices. And uh, yeah, sometimes these res this uh, work results in, in government assignments to agencies. So, uh, after a, an idea has been processed, uh, processed within the government offices, maybe we task 
some of our agencies to try to work with work take these ideas further and we also try to do do some communication activities um, you know twitter and so on uh, and also on the government uh, webpage and next slide please um, i'm trying to keep time i hope i have five more minutes <laughs> um, yeah so the members as you can see uh, is is um, the prime minister who's leading the meetings and then we have four other ministries four other ministers uh, the Minister for Environment and Climate, um, the Minister for Finance, the Minister for Business, Industry and Innovation, and the Minister for Higher Education and Research. And then we have 12 appointed external members, and these people are selected uh, and handpicked on a personal mandate. So they first and foremost represent themselves and their competence. Um, but uh, if you see where they come from, they represent uh, big companies, uh, innovative startups, uh, academia, public sector, labor unions, incubators and science parks. So it's quite a, quite a big variety of, of representation. And uh, sometimes we invite external guests, uh, keynote speakers, uh, and so on. So there might be some additional guests uh, joining the meetings, but th this, is, this is the core, core team uh, for each meeting. Um, next, please. And here's, I'm not going through this uh, in detail. I'm just mentioning a few of the topics. Um, when we select uh, the to topics, it's, it's the government, um, the political level who decides on, on the topics. Uh, there's a collaborative process between ministries. And um, we've talked about data as a strategic resource. We talk a lot about climate change. Um, we talk about the university system. We talk about the water management, e-health and so on. Um, yeah, and, and the last meeting was actually quite recently, last week, 22nd of June. And, and the whole meeting was focusing on recovery after the COVID-19 crisis. So that really connects to today's topic as well. Um, and as I told you before, it's been, we've been having the Innovation Council since 2015. So there's been, of course, a lot of work during the pre previous years. And I, I also put in the sustainable development goals here because we try to see how innovation in Sweden <laughs> relates to the, to the broader picture on a global level and, and um, how what we do in Sweden can, can um, support the sustainable development goals. Next, please. Um, and like I said, there's uh, the Innovation Council is an advisory board, so there's, there are no formal decisions being taken, but regardless, there, there are a few results coming out uh, from, from the discussions, and these are some examples of, of things that happened uh, in Sweden, initiatives from the government and so on, that kind of relates to things that have been discussed in the Innovation Council. And, a lot of this, these are government initiatives regarding digitalization, public venture capital, policy labs, research and innovation bill, public procurement, also international collaborations actually. Uh, we've been discussing how Sweden connects to the outside world quite a lot and how, how we work bilater bilaterally. Um, yeah, so uh, next slide please. Um, I'll try to wrap it up. This is kind of my last slide. Um, some reflections. I would like to say that we see that uh, there are a few benefits of having a National Innovation Council. First of all, there is a way of, of setting the agenda. The topics that are selected and discussed within the National Innovation Council uh, are, are being um, sort of giving a, a certain um, uh, weight, so to speak, because you have the prime minister and you have several ministers in the same room. And that means that the ideas that are discussed and the outcome of the discussions, and when there is a consensus in the room, that's quite a strong signal from the government. It's qu also quite a strong signal to the ministries that we need to work together, this question is important, let's do something about it. Um, 
so 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 that's the momentum part of it and also the sounding board part is this council is an opportunity for the government to try out some ideas with the members of the council so the ministers may propose some ideas that are not quite ready yet but still uh, something that is in the pipeline for for the government and and getting some feedback from from the from the members and um, also like i said there's a lot about connecting different parts of society and trying to get the the researchers the the academia university view on things and also the business perspective and an agency perspective and then we have there's a lot of things happening after the meetings where we try to connect uh, ministries and agencies and, and really create these kind of cross-discipline uh, initiatives. So, um, yeah, that creates a lot of good policy development. Um, and last slides, I just wanted to show you some pictures. This is a picture from one of our regional meetings uh, in the city of Kalmar where we gathered a lot of regional representatives and the, the prime minister and his state secretary is leading the meeting, as you can see. Um, and uh, yeah, next slide, please. And this is just a photo of the prime minister talking to three of the members in the council that represents uh, AstraZeneca, which is a large pharmaceutical company, SKF, which is a, which is a really famous uh, world-renowned ball bearing, bearing company, and also Sofia Benz, who is leading uh, Atomico, which is a venture capital firm investing in startups. So, so yeah, that was my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for your talk. And I think that that explains a lot. You know, I pick up uh, many pointers from you, you know, being from the NIA and, and from the government side. I think it's, it's quite important that I, I think you have a very challenging job, you know, putting four ministry uh, together and the minister in order in, in one room. I think that's that's quite a big challenge. And uh, and I think that uh, the, the council has done, you know, you talk about multiple policy setting, you're talking about, you know, not only talking about tax, right, and, and investment, but of course, uh, to, to use innovation as societal to, to to solve societal challenges and of course talking about uh, doing in the regional and you know bringing mm. everybody come to to all inclusive innovations of regional level and work yeah. together what we call a quadruple helix university government right private sector exactly plus, yeah people of the community and, of, and and lastly i like what you put there in the slides of communications and that's like the big key uh, for for mm. government as well, right? To to have momentum and to communicate of these uh, together, and also of the policy to the to the public and how the members are comprised of all private sectors and also the government to to work together. Excellent, thank yeah. you. Okay, then we moved on to our um, our next speaker. He is of course the chief strategist advisor of uh, Vinnova. And he will talk about systematic and holistic approach in creating innovation society. And let me introduce to you, uh, Shell Holden Nafet. Verdikat, once again, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, do you see my presentation? Yes, now? we see it perfectly clear and hear you well. Fine, good. Because I want to uh, compliment perhaps the previous speakers. Uh, give uh, some sort of uh, introduction to our strategic direction for the future and also in relation to that give some words about Vino Vinova. So, so I want to talk about innovation, using innovation to achieve a better and more sustainable future for, for all. Because as Carl was saying, uh, what, let's see, what if, do you see any, it doesn't change in my view? Uh. Can you say use the arrow for the? Yeah, uh, it doesn't happen anything. Okay. I will stop sharing and do it again. Okay. I will try to share it once again. Okay, and then. No, it doesn't work. Okay, now it it comes up. All right, and then. Use the uh, cursor on your slides and then. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't. Yeah, now. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, our focus is is really innovation, and and as Carl was pointing out, innovation has never been as important as now if we want to have a sustainable future in, uh, on our planet. But we are running out of uh, uh, time, which is important to understand here. Uh, this is uh, a picture from the Stockholm Resilience Center that shows the planetary boundaries, and and uh, we are stressing the planetary boundaries quite a lot uh, together uh, on, on Earth and. And there's, uh, the researchers point out that we are in a state of planetary emergency. And there's some mathematics from the nature around it. I don't have the time to go into it, but it shows that we are really in emergency situation and we have to address it. This is the scientist way of putting it. Uh, the Swedish 17 year old uh, climate activist, Greta Thunberg has put it more in a plain language. She says our house is on fire and we have to start putting out the fire, we cannot wait. Uh, and that's one of the future, important future directions for us all using innovation, because traditional policy measures are not able really to address these huge challenges we are, uh, that are associated with the de development on, uh, of global sustainable society. Uh, society. So what we are looking into and trying to learn is how to use mission-driven innovation to address this in a, in a new way through innovation. And mission-driven innovation is really about mobilizing all parts of society through innovative ways to change the society and the system. And this is one thing that we are currently looking deeply in and trying to learn how to, uh, to, to do. And, and you can see with the COVID-19 epidemic, the power when you have something together, a mission to, to address globally. So, so this is something that the EU and a lot of countries are looking into, and we are also doing this. Also, innovation is global. It has no borders. Trade rules, regimes, flows are important and necessary inputs to innovation activities. And utilization of intellectual assets, innovation and inno uh, inventions are important if you want to address this. Now, together what we see is trade wars. We see uh, borders are closed. We see nationalist movements. These are, in my view, very dangerous things. What we have to have, we have to maintain and strengthen an open society that embraces collaborations and competition because you have to have both. You have to collaborate, but you also have to compete because that drives really uh, innovation as has been pointed out with the uh, previous speakers. I also believe that innovation and entrepreneurship are the only ways to sustain competitive and relevant in this fast changing world. Uh, and, uh, and in some cases, you think about this like entrepreneurship and innovation, that it's something properties of, of persons. If you would have been in, in, in the uh, 15, 14, 15, 16th centuries, you would have uh, said that you have to f research or science, science uh, being a scientist is something in your DNA. Government has to find the individuals that have this DNA and then remove the obstacles so that they can provide something good for society. I would say that innovation and entrepreneurship is not the DNA. It's about skill and methods that you can learn. In the same way as, as the scientific method really changed the, the society in a lot, because shoemakers' children didn't, didn't have to become shoemakers. They could use higher education to really change their uh, path in society. Now, innovation and entrepreneurship, you can learn, and it's important to address uh, uh, that very early in schools and so on. But to pursue uh, this journey for a better future, this requires governments to, to consider a few things. One thing is really to facilitate directionality and priority. And in our case, we are using the sustainability goals and the Agenda 2030 to, to have a directionality for society and, and show what kind of things we have to prioritize. The traditional way of, of governments to, to uh, to work is uh, to be passive, uh, uh, passive interventions on market and systemic failure. But we have to move from these passive interventions to active facilitation of system transformation. So the government has to involve itself in facilitating the system to transform itself towards a sustainable society, giving direction and directionality, directionality and priorities. And that this is also something that we are experimenting with and, and trying to learn how to uh, work with. We also need to foster a broader view of innovation. Usually you think about innovation as new creations, but it's not, it's new value creation. 
and uh, I haven't time to go through this uh, slide, but I want you to focus you on that we really want to learn more about how to orchestrate ecosystem innovations, how to mobilize actors in an innovative way to change, to, to give uh, prosperity or, or and, and propensity for certain kind of behavior that helps us create a sustainable uh, future. So ecosystem innovation is one new area that we really uh, look more, more and more uh, deeply into. But we also have to f facilitate uh, improved innovation skills. Innovation managers is one of the key assets and key uh, uh, skills and properties that you can have in your organization and, and uh, uh, in your policy development. And it involves understanding how to co-create across organizational borders. But do that in a still in a, in a way that you manage your intellectual asset in, in, a, in a correct way. And perhaps more the most important thing is to manage learning processes and it's it's not it's complete you to develop to manage a learning process completely different than to manage a development project because you have to understand that in these kind of de uh, developments or, or evolution success is an outlier most things fail so you have to uh, uh, embrace an experimental economy where you have a lot of experiments and you have to selection mechanisms so that you know these things seems to work and then you uh, put more and more resources and, uh, and investments in, in uh, those things that seem to work. We know why it's in the center of these uh, uh, developments. And we tried, of course, to take advantage of, of Sweden as, as an innovative nation. We are 200 employees. Most of them are in Stockholm. We have small offices in Brussels, Silicon Valley, and Tel Aviv. And we are a government agency under the Ministry of uh, Enterprise and in Innovation. Uh, this is our office in, in Stockholm. And uh, there we promote, we fund, and we facilitate innovation at all individual, organizational, and systems level. Our budget is about 3.3 uh, uh, billion Swedish kronor, and we are currently engaged in about 4,000 4, projects, which is usually the pro portfolio we have. Uh, this has all been, uh, we take advantage of Sweden, of course, as a place for innovation. Uh, I don't have to talk about that. Carl made a really good presentation on, on, on that. Uh, we are a small country, you know, we are in an area about 90% of Thailand, but we are smaller than in inhabitants than Bangkok. Uh, but we are an open curios uh, curiosity driven uh, society that has really a, a global outlook uh, since uh, many years back. Uh, Usually we work with these two worlds, research where you publish or perish, or in the commercial where you have to have customers pay your bills. We believe that we can bridge those uh, two and really create research and innovation for a sustainable growth. Uh, we do it by supporting need-driven research that are addressing uh, challenges in the commercial and in the society. We support bridge heads on things that are come up from the research world, so it becomes adapted to the commercial world. We stimulate collaboration between all uh, actors and sectors that are needed to facilitate innovation. And we also support adaption of R&D results for commercial exploitation. Here are some examples of initiatives and programs uh, at Vinova. Uh, I don't have the time to go through them, but if there's any questions afterwards in the q and I'm, I'm happy to try to answer those. But you can see it's a broad thing from uh, uh, most of them are very collaborative, trying to connect different parts of, of the society in, in innovation engagements. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Xiao, uh, from, from Vinova. I've seen that, you know, uh, from your mission, uh, you, you granted and funding a lot of, uh, a lot of projects, uh, and you said about 4,000 projects each, uh, you know, uh, so annually or, or, you know, periodically, and that's, that's quite a huge amount, and, and that's why it creates such a momentum, I think, and, and what I like that that you talked about i think that it's it's quite 
uh, you know, obvious that innovations come from from education or from people too, right? Because you're talking about innovation management, you're talking about skill set and methods and and what we, you know, people can learn to be innovate. And also, of course, the uh, Vinova is mission-driven innovations uh, type of organizations. And I think that that's quite important to talk about that. Okay, great. Yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it's easy to, re I think you're doing the right comment because it's so easy to become, you know, this functional and structural, but everything happens with people. It's people that make things happen. Exactly. Exactly, exactly, and I, I do, I do manage, you know, and, and of course, Ned, uh, we, we stress as a, you know, NAA and Vinova, we kind of, you know, counterpart in terms of innovation agency, and of course, we have this pillar in NAA as well that, you know, we build people and entrepreneurship, and of course, the innovative organizations. Of course, you know, every everything comes from people, right? So great. Uh, and of course, last but not least, our last speaker today for, on, the, on the talk is Sarah Brunch, and she would definitely talk about from Aomi, and she would talk about creating sustainable innovation-based ecosystem from Aomi. So let me give the floor to you. Thank you. So I think that was a good bridge when we're talking about people, and it's people behind the innovations, because my perspective is going to be more about uh, the SMEs behind the innovation. Uh, so it's going to take on the innovative company perspective. It's very important that we understand the needs of these companies um, because they uh, understanding that is vital to building these um, really well-performing ecosystems of innovation. And in Sweden, 95% of all companies are SMEs. So they form a base. It's like a bottom-up perspective. And most innovative companies have been small. So... Um, let's start by looking a little bit at the Almi Corporation. So can I ask Patty, please, to, um, yes, and move on to the second slide. Thank you. So Almi is a, uh, owned by the Swedish government. We are a corporation with a mission to develop and finance SMEs in Sweden and contribute to their sustainable growth. And when we say finance, we mean both venture capital and loans. And we are supplementary to the private sector. That means that we always work together with banks or other investors, for instance, uh, when it comes to equity. We have uh, 500 employees in 40 locations across uh, our long country, Sweden. And we are structured in two business areas. We have the business unit, Fertox Partner, which I also head up, which is our largest business unit, handling loans and business development services. And then we also have our business unit, Invest, which is our venture capital unit. When it comes to uh, Furtox Partner, we work with both startups and scale up coaching, including all areas of business. So very, very broad finance, innovation, internationalization, digitalization, sustainable growth, et cetera. And when it comes to uh, Invest, where we actually move in with equity investments, we are looking mainly at tech-based com companies with um, innovative tech USPs, and they form the base of our um, investments, which are uh, structured in eight regional funds and one national green tech fund. So let's move on. And you could argue that why Almi, you know, in a, in, a, in a country like Sweden where things are working quite well, why do you need a government owned company that promotes innovation and sustainable growth? Well, basically there is a market gap in Sweden for affordable business services and for financing. So that's partly why we're here. We also have a counter cyclical mission. Uh, that means that when the economy is going downwards, we step in even more uh, as has been seen now throughout the crisis and through um, periods of, of really uh, tough financial situations. But the other thing we do is that we take a significantly higher risk than I would say that the finance sector does in general in Sweden. So, and you do need to take risk because as Shell, um, uh, Shell Håkan said, innovation is partly about failing. So risk taking has to be inherent in, in your support structure of the innovation system. And we have loads of customers and we challenge them, we coach them, we work really close to, close to them. And we have about 15,000 active customers in Sweden. So please, next slide. 
just to give you an example of the leverage you can get from a company like Almi, because we co-invest and we co-finance, we have for the past 25 years invested about 40 billion Swedish kroner in loans. That's given us a leverage from banks with co-financing of 110 billion. And it's the same when it comes to our invested VC. We have 2.5 billion coming from Almi, but again, generating 12 billion uh, from the rest uh, of the sort of VC market from, from uh, business angels, etc. So this is how you can get leverage from a company. Let's move on. Right, so innovation ecosystems, what are they uh, and how do they work? Um, this is a really philosophical and quite interesting question and you could discuss this for hours. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see uh, an example of a picture of what the Stockholm tech ecosystem could look like. And it's basically both companies in various sectors and it's, it's financiers and it's other support companies within the sector. But what we think here at Almi is that one has to be a little bit careful when creating an ecosystem because there is a risk of streamlining, harmonizing and overstructuring a system which could actually dampen the innovative um, efforts of those who inhabit the system. So we think about fertilizing the ecosystem instead, creating a prerequisite for survival and development of the companies that are actually in the system. Think of it, uh, think of it as, as a rainforest. So you don't want to create a monoculture, you want to keep the rainforest alive, but you need to make sure that the temperature's right and there's the right amount of sunlight or warmth or heat or whatever. And that I think is the role of all um, the players within this system is to make sure that the prerequisites are right for innovation development. Please move on. So there are a couple of, of things I think you need to do uh, when you're an actor like Almi and where you work very closely uh, to the innovation uh, companies in the system. First of all, you need to know who is your innovation customer in the system. Uh, it could be the entrepreneur, it could be the founder of the company, but it could also be an entrepreneur. That is a change agent, a change leader within the company, not necessarily the CEO, for instance. And Almi, we work with both. Uh, we think that's very important. Next slide, please. The other thing you need to do is you need to be a close partner to your innovation customer. And we work with the customer from a very, very early stage, early ideas phase, basically, uh, up to a sustainable, scalable business model phase. And you need to be there for the entire journey. And you need to understand and know your customer. And we work, for instance, with a method called the MUM test uh, by Rob Fitzpatrick, where it's all about asking the right questions. And that's the model that we use at Almi to understand our innovative customers better, to promote their innovations. And it's also a model that our customers use to understand their end customer needs better. So be a partner, be close to your uh, customers. Next slide, please. Once you're close, you need to build innovation insight. Uh, and I think one of the insights that we're working with is that the SME is not a small, large company. Uh, it is a, a different animal, but it does face the same increasingly complex business environment as a larger company does, but it seldom has the resources or the tools to deal uh, we, with these complex issues. So the challenge, I think, for the system is to ensure that the support and the tools that you bring forward are actually adapted to SME needs and resources. So don't overcomplicate things, be quite straightforward um, in, within the support structure that you actually deliver in the system. Very, very important. Next slide, please. The other thing is you need to be everywhere. Uh, not only in urban or densely populated areas, uh, because innovation can basically come from anywhere. Uh, so you need both a national and a local presence, and you need to cooperate with uh, both national and local businesses. You need to cooperate with authorities and partners in the ecosystem everywhere. 
Uh, we believe in close cooperation with the incubation system, for instance, and the science park system through all phases of a company, pre-incubation, during incubation and post-incubation, you uh, can work also with an Alni type of company. Uh, and this is important to understand the different local industry structures because they are often the source of, of innovation that can then become national or even global. And you need to work actively by spreading national research findings to your entire country. Briefly moving on, um, offering just a very quick perspective on the COVID situation that we're in now. Uh, last but not least, you need to act fast. Uh, and here you need to have the ability to quickly reallocate resources within the ecosystem at the time of a crisis, for instance. So understanding those needs, understanding your role. In our case, it was about flooding the market with uh, liquidity. Uh, bridge loaning uh, launch, suspension of amortization, for instance, to ensure that the innovative companies remain um, solid throughout the crisis, that they keep liquidity in their company. We also need to simulate the economic impact of the crisis together with these companies. That's a business uh, service that we offer. And again, work closely with the partners in the system. And as we are moving in the crisis and maybe seeing the light in the tunnel, we need to stimulate growth out of the crisis. We need to kickstart finance a lot of these companies. Some of them are actually innovative within the crisis and some need to sort of kickstart and, and restart their companies. We need to ensure that everything is digital and we need to focus on sustainable, smart recovery and growth as, as Shell Horkan uh, mentioned previously as well. And the interesting thing to see in the crisis is you have to keep a double mode. You have to work with companies in crisis, but you also have to work with those innovative companies that are actually growing in the crisis because you have those as well. So we've been doing both. So briefly, just a very, very quick summary. Fertilize the innovation system, but don't, don't overstructure it. Um, identify who your customer is, know your customer, uh, gain that customer insight, be a partner to the customer, be everywhere and act fast. So with those words, I'd like to say thank you. That's my last thank slide. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Very nicely done. Uh, it, you know, with your conclusion, I think you've said it all, you know, uh, be satellite, but also which means distributed. But at the same time, don't I like this? Don't overcomplicate the things. You know, there's many times that we are in this area of innovations or, or work, then we we think too much. You know, that's that's yeah. my word. Sometimes we think too much, so and we overcomplicate the thing. But I've seen that you know you've done a lot of your ventures and loans and all financial mechanisms and and. Uh, your, I think your success is that the sense that you said you are close partner to your customers, know who they are and, and work with them on the, on, in their area, actually, right? Go yes. into the distributed, not only in the center or in the, uh, in where the capital is. And the other part is about prerequisite. Basically, that's like building infrastructures of yeah. each of these individuals or company or startups or pre-incubation so that they have the right mindset and they have the right uh, combinations in order to grow right and and be resilient in all the in all the challenges that they are facing okay great so yes we are good with time i think you know it's a and it's you know to the audience as well it's a it's a long session but i think we learn a lot and we understand you know how the ecosystem of sweden work and how you know each of the organizations work parallelly i think and i think you're doing it quite well from the government level and also the other so i may now uh, ask for other speaker to uh, turn on your video if you can uh, and and we would go to uh, last but not least the summary and the q a and i have actually a question from uh, one of the audience and and, and he actually sent this before and and this uh, well, the person is a PhD student, and they're actually you know study. He's actually study in in uh, Sweden. Uh, not sure if it's a he or a she, but anyhow, uh, she talks about how you know before we are in this COVID situation, right? We probably in some country is already a little bit like losing the lockdown. Some country are still you know seriously affected. Uh, but anyhow, pre-COVID situation is that 
before this, we talk a lot about globalizations, talking about global value chains and all that. But now because of this situation of the crisis, then we are locked down or, you know, cannot really do a lot of uh, communicate, uh, let's say commission or uh, traveling. And, and this of course affect the global value chain. So, so her question is that with this new normal, what do you think about how we can create innovation without being, let's say traveling so much? I think one of the answer is this type of sessions. Don't you think? We don't have to actually go and meet, but we can still share, we can collaborate. This is for the knowledge session. But of course, uh, in terms of businesses, you still need to move things around. I any advice on that? You know, that's one part of the questions. Another question is that, what are your recommendations for company right now? You know, of this a little bit of some would say, you know, in the post COVID era, how would they move on? What are the important issue that they need to think about? Of course they need to think about everything, but I mean, you know, what would you, what would you pick up to be the first focus that they need to actually tackle so that they are ready for the post COVID and the, and the uh, crisis of economy that, to come in all countries and things like that. Okay, so so of course it's a it's a it's a one long question. It's it's divided in two parts. One would be global value chain. Another one would be like post COVID recommendations. This uh, I talk about company or startups, and let me go through you on your answers one by one, and then we can close this very nicely. So let's go to Carl first, maybe. Yeah, uh, wait, let me do that. Thank you so much for the question. I, I see what we have limited time, so I'll, I'll try to be very brief on a, on a very, very big question. So yeah, I think it is very clear that that the COVID-19 situation is, is, is much more uh, than the tragedy about uh, people succumbing to a terrible virus. I, I think that, that COVID-19 will kind of function as a, as a global refraction point that will see some trends that we saw prior to 2020 change its course. Some will accelerate, some will uh, decelerate in many ways. Uh, I think that when it comes to the points of gravity in the global world, which countries will emerge um, as, as leaders and standard setters and which countries will fall into, into obscurity uh, will very much define the global business landscape. Uh, we are, of course, moving towards with digitalization we are through initiatives like this, but I also think that we will see more and more data protectionism, that, that data will often be walled off and not shared. Um, shared as much. I think that the government, of course, in, in, in all countries are, 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 are very much intervening in the economy, saving companies, uh, uh, hindering them from, from having to do massive layoffs and so on. And I think that the governments, the local governments will continue to set the business agenda for the 10 years to come. Um, I think that supply chains will, will largely uh, be transformed and automated and often regionalized. A lot of Swedish companies see that they are, have been very reliant on supply chains and input factors uh, from countries where, where lockdowns ha has made it impossible for them to, to produce their final assembled goods uh, and so on. So I, I think there's a lot of stuff happening and, and, and this decade that that we just kicked off with this with this terrible situation will be, I think, very, very defining in, in, in many ways. I, I think that Swedish companies or, or Thai companies or any companies really need to, to um, focus much more on these global trends uh, and see how they impact their business. This is not business as usual and this will not remain business as usual. So I think that COVID-19 can be seen as a wake up call to really think about the operations, think about the strategy and how to make, uh, how to make your business much more resilient. Okay, great. Thank you, Carl. Uh, let me, uh, Eric, anything to add? Yeah, I would just like to say that um, I think it's very important that companies uh, keep investing in research and development uh, and governments as well. Uh, I mean, there's, of course, a risk that you look at your cost situation and, and during the recovery phase that you, uh, well, down prioritize uh, R&D. And uh, I think that would be a mistake, I think, just as a general reflection. I also think that companies should... should uh, really integrate sustainability issues in the recovery process. Um, also on a larger scale, of course, on, on, a, on a global level that we, we, we cannot afford to first try to get back to business uh, in the old ways and, and then try to implement uh, sustainability measures and so on. This has to be integrated in, in the recovery process. Um, I also think for government side, I think this is, an, this is a very good timing to use public procurement as a way for governments to 
demand uh, innovative solutions and to support innovative companies. I mean, public procurement is an in, in, incredibly powerful tool for governments to, to engage and involve uh, innovative startups, innovative companies to, to, to develop new solutions. And, and this is really a good timing to do that. Uh, and yeah, I'll stop there. Okay, great. You're talking about SDG and, you know, for the company to still invest in R&D because we, you don't, you never know what are the uh, crises you're going to face later on either, right? So right. I think still the, the balance between operations and right now, and of course the investment. Okay, Xiao, um, there's another question for Xiao as well uh, that said, what is challenge-driven innovation? I think you talked about that a little bit, so maybe you clarify that and also uh, to my questions of post-COVID, Xiao. It, uh, Carl and Eric did a good answer. I don't have much to, but I think something that has been uh, shown in these kind of uh, changes is that you don't only work and invest in uh, individual, in silos, in R&D and innovation, but it's really important also if you want to, uh, to adapt and adjust to a new world, to do it in collaboration. And uh, there's examples where you have done done uh, where companies have done that which also changes their business models so when you change the way you work with your business and with your production and with your R&D you also have to change the business model and those have to be changed in the value chain so you need a collaborative uh, effort also on the business model uh, level which is uh, really important when you do this kind of adaptment and adjustment for uh, for the future which is really digitally, digitally driven in, in the future more than we have seen uh, uh, today, both in, in value change and, and in offerings and so on. So, so uh, that was my, my addition to that. When we talk about mission-driven, uh, um, I, I, I didn't say challenge, I said mission-driven innovation, it's a way of, of innovating across organizational boundaries. Mm -hmm. For example, so if we, we have seen an, a mission on providing uh, like more healthy food for children in, in school in addressing uh, both uh, uh, obscenity, obscenity or, or, or overweight and, and, and uh, healthy. It's, 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 it really covers not only uh, the school system, it covers the suppliers of food, the co covers the transportation of the, it, uh, the, the way of managing waste. Uh, so it really covers a lot of different actors, their business model, their offerings, and that's what we talk about mission driven. You have a certain mission or when you see the COVID-19 is a good like mission, what do we need to, to work with? We need to have protections, we need to have vaccine, we, there's a lot of things that has to happen around that has to be coordinated in such a way to address the mission of, 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 of handling, for example, COVID-19. So that was, is what mission driven innovation is about. Right. Okay. Thank you. And I think, I mean, the word itself, it's, it's already kind of uh, self-explanatory, right? It's not technology. It's not just one silo. It's, you know, come together to, to do something and make it successful. And, and you talk about collaborations as well. Okay. Sarah, anything to add on post-COVID suggestion? Yeah, I just wanted to say that any um, sort of um, driven entrepreneur will always be thinking about the future. So they will not be stuck in today uh, in the crisis or just outside of the crisis. They'll be thinking about the future. And it's not only about investing in R&D, it's about investing in the future also in the future business model. So you always have to be one step ahead. Um, and I would say today it's you become digital or you die. Um, I don't think there is any, there's nowhere we're gonna go back. It's about going forward from where we are today. Great, thank you. All right. May I add uh, something, uh, Teresa? I think one thing that uh, I mentioned and which is really important is to understand that we have to experiment. Uh, you know the difference between complicated and complex. Uh, in complex uh, systems, you can analyze and do an analysis, and in 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 a in a, in a, in a complex system, uh, it you you have to experiment. You have you don't know what will work, and that where it comes where entrepreneurship is so important. You have to dare to do different experiments and see what uh, succeeds. If you look from a, from a systemic or national or, or global point of view, and entrepreneurship is so important in looking the future, test new ideas. 
Right, right. Agree. And I think I, I'd like my, my to, uh, if, if I may add, you know, we're talking about risk because I think innovation is risk, right? It's risky. Everybody needs to understand how, how risk, risky that is. But of course, still going to the mission, then you need to take that risk, right? And then that's the challenge that as innovation people need to do. And also another point uh, is, of course, uh, as Sarah said, right, innovations uh, are actually the startups or it, for me, it comes down to people. It's the leader, it's the CEO, it's the individual. You are innovative people. If you are, then you always think, as, you know, many steps ahead, right? You're not stuck in the present. And I think that's kind of a core of it. Uh, we are, of course, running out of time. There's actually a few more questions I'd just like to maybe answer in general. Of NAA, if we have project for individual, we have a lot of training, a lot of uh, support. You know, you can contact us later for that. And I think talking about consensus versus experimental, I think, uh, uh, Shell, you talk about experimental, talking about how we need to experiment and take risks. But I think consensus by way of speaker, they mean that, you know, if you have to have to do something in the mission, then of course, in that mission, you need to have consensus in order for everyone to see the same objectives to go into that direction and work together. But yes, they both, you know, we need to go on that balance between experimental and, and come together in a, in a, you know, in a goal that we want to achieve. Okay, great session. I think you enjoyed it. Uh, all the audience and all the speaker, all the, um, uh, His Excellency, Her Excellency, the ambassadors who join us, Dr. Pan Ad. I thank you, everyone. It's a very fruitful session. And, you know, you can contact us later. We can give you the slides and we can also, you know, give the contact of the speaker if you have more questions and I'm happy, I, I, I'm sure they're happy to answer your questions, okay? So um, let's do this. Thank you so much. And you know, until we see again, learn together and be innovative. Thank you. So what Until we meet again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks bye. everyone. Very Thank fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.